Okay, everyone, welcome. Welcome to the second day of Marxism uh, 2023. If it's your first meeting, welcome to your first meeting. I'm Geraldine. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party, and my Hackney, my branch, rather, is in Hackney, in East London. Um, so I'm going to briefly explain how the meeting works so people know. Um, our speaker is going to speak for uh, 30 minutes. Then I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbor or neighbors for two, three minutes. And then I will call you back in the main room for questions and contributions. Please raise your hand. I will try to call as many people as possible, but keep it to three minutes. So after two minutes, I will, I will do that very unknowingly. And then after three minutes, I will ask you to sum up. Um, so the meeting today is is progress of or catastrophe, Lukash, Benjamin, and German anti fascist Marxism. The speaker is uh, Andrew Milner, um, he's from Melbourne, and he used to be a member of the IS in the 60s. I think yeah, 60, yeah, 70s, 70s. In the 70s. Um, Andrew lives in uh, Melbourne, as I said, and uh, is an eco socialist activist. Um, he's a retired academic and has written plenty on sci fi and climate change. Uh, without further ado, thank you. Uh, good morning, comrades. Um, and look, I'd like to thank you for turning up at 10 o'clock in the morning to hear me talk about German Marxists. Um, right, okay. Um, uh, those two German Marxists in particular. Uh, strictly speaking, Lukas uh, wasn't quite German, he was Hungarian. Um, but he, was, he spoke fluent German and he wrote fluent German. And, uh, for most of the 1920s, he was a Covington agent in Germany, right? So I think we can count him as an honorary German. Um, what intrigued me about comparing these two um, is, is that they're in, in some ways, they're in analogous situations. Right? They're, they're both German speakers. Um, they're both confronted by the rise of fascism in Germany, national socialism, and, uh, and, and they're, they're anti fascist of course. But their responses are totally different, right? They're both from within a Marxist framework. They, they respond they respond completely differently. And it was the contrast uh, that made me think, yeah, I want, I, want to, I want to pursue this. Why did they do these things differently? Now, they are, as I said, very different. Uh, Lukas was a member of the Hungarian Communist Party. He joined the Hungarian Communist Party shortly after it was founded. And he was a member of the, of, the, of the government of the Hungarian Soviet Republic, which was briefly established in, in 1918. But he fought in the, in the fifth regiment um, uh, as they resisted the Romanian fascist invasion. Uh, and and that's, where he's, that's his introduction to communist politics. Uh, after the failure uh, of the Hungarian Soviet Republic, he fled to, initially to, to Austria and then to, then to Germany. And he was in Germany for much of the, the 1920s, um, as not for much of that time, as a communist agent, he was always a member of the Communist Party. Uh, his his theoretical writings uh, are probably what he's in the West most famous for. He in this period, he, he wrote a little book on Lenin, which Lenin didn't approve of, uh, and he also wrote History and Class Consciousness, which I, someone else is giving a talk about later on in this conference, uh, and which is one of the famous texts of the, of the making of, of Western Marxism. Uh, Marx is a very different kind of what Alex Klinikos likes, right? And definitely not Al Jazeera. Um, but it was a very influential text, a very influential text, influential text, amongst other things in, in some in the SWP IS at one time. Chris Harmon was a great admirer uh, of history and class consciousness. So was Ian Birchall. Um, so was John Rees, but I don't suppose you talk about him anymore. Um, right. okay. right. Now, it's an influential text, and, and Lukash is an influential figure. Okay. Now, Benjamin is very, very different. Benjamin is not a member of the German Communist Party at all. Um, he's, he's, he's famous, of course, for his, for his collaboration with Bertolt Brecht. Uh, there, there's a close friendship and correspondence. Uh, but Benjamin is uh, he's, he, he's a sort of casual academic associated with the Frankfurt School in the 1920s. He has a, he's not on the salary the way Adorno and Horkheimer were. He's sort of he's doing casual lecturing. So those of you who are, who are badly employed by universities will understand the conditions in which which he worked uh, in that time. But he was also a journalist uh, and, and a journalist in print, uh, but also for radio. He, he was he, he, this is in the Weimar Republic. Okay, so he's a journalist uh, and a kind a kind of activist, but certainly not a communist party activist. So they're very very different. They're very different figures. Uh, they have in common that they're both, both German speakers 
and that they're, they're increasingly appalled by the rise of national socialism. Now, uh, being appalled isn't enough. <laughs> they're appalled and they want, they want to do something about it. Uh, now, what I want to do now is explore their, their, their writings. But, but bear in mind that, that, that Lukash is, 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 is a Comintern agent and he stays in Berlin until the, until the Nazi basically sees him <laughs> when he flees. And he doesn't flee to America the way many of these German Marxists did. He, he flees to Moscow the way a Comintern agent would. Right, okay. Uh, Benjamin also flees. And then if you stay, you get killed. Benjamin, however, goes to Paris. Right, that's, now, uh, what, and they and in their exiles they respond to the triumph of national socialism. They both do, but in different ways. Now, okay, I want to look at the two responses. I'm going to talk about firstly Lukash's the historical novel, which he which he actually wrote in in Moscow in 1936 1937. The dates actually matter, but I'll come back to that. In a minute. Right um, now. Uh, what Lukash, the, 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 the thing that the historical novel is most famous for is it's the most sympathetic treatment of Sir Walter Scott ever written by a Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can laugh, but Lukash has reasons for this. He says, you know, Sir Walter Scott, I can help all that stuff. Right, okay. Now, but what Lukash does in the, his, in the historical novel is he treats history, his historical novels, as a kind of history writer. His idea is, that, that, what, that historical novels are ways of writing about real history. And that for him is the significance of Scott, that he actually writes about real history. Can I have the second next slide now? I've got a quote. Yes, I have clear. I'll look at on the historical novel. Um, and his, his point is that the aim of a novel, the aim of a historical novel, is to represent a particular social reality at a particular time. And his arguments are the rest of it. You know, it's just if you want the details, it's there. But he argues um, that this new genre, and, and he says it's a new genre that comes in in the late 18th, early 19th century, it's a product of a new understanding of history. And that understanding is the collective experience of the Napoleonic Wars, which is, of course is a continent-wide experience, uh, all the way from Britain through to Russia. What he says about, can I have another slide? Right, okay, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's what I want to write. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, what he says about what significance of that to Sir Walter Scott. But I, I'm not winning you over to Scott, but I'll try and win you over to Lukash. Right? He said, "Is that, that these are national stories? They're national stories, stories of how nations are made." And Scott is in favour of the making of these nations. He affirms this progress. He is, as it says on the slide, he is a patriot. He is proud of the development of his people. And this patriotism is vital, he says, because it allows um, the felt relationship between the past and the present uh, to, be, to be experienced. Now, I won't, I won't make a casual aside about this, that in fact, whilst this, I find this quite persuasive, yeah, but, but in fact, Lucrece is wrong about which nation Scott is writing about. Um, all the way through, and not all the way through the book, he refers to Scott as English, and these stories is about the making of England. And, and as, as the name Scott might have actually led you to think about, actually, they're all about the first eleven of them in his novels are all about the making of the Scottish nation. But we all make mistakes, right? right. But the, the point about patriotism stands. It does. Now, um, can I have the next slide? Yeah. Right, um, but the, the historical novel goes into goes into decline, Lukash argues, and he, he traces this to Gustav Flaubert's Salon Board, in which uh, it ceases to be a realistic account of what actually happened in history. Um, and he and, and Lukash argues there's a reason for this, and the reason for this is the success of the bourgeois revolutions in 1848. Um, Salon Bull came out in 1862, which is conveniently after the 1848 revolutions. What he argues is, is, is that the bourgeois revolutions are successful. The bourgeoisie is now essentially in power. That's a slight exaggeration, but you know, it's, it's cost culturally in power. Um, and and the, that, that results in a transformation of bourgeois values away from revolutionary democracy and into compromising liberalism. Hence the decline of the historical novel. But all these, there's always a happy ending. Uh, always in reality. Uh, but in the last chapter of the historical novel, and remember I said that he, he writes this in 1936 37. 
in the last chapter, he says the historical novel yeah. is being reborn uh, as the historical novel of democratic humanism. And it is so, he says, um, uh, I quote, today's historical novel has arisen and is developing amid the dawn of a new democracy. Right. Uh, and 36, 37. No, no, no. It's the first year of the Spanish of the Spanish Revolution. It's the Spanish Civil War. Thirty, and that's what it is. That's what Lucas sees. The historical novel is being reborn because of the rebirth of the of, 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 of Spanish democracy. Right. And um, this may have been an over optimistic reading, actually. But but in thirty six, in thirty six, uh, as Barcelona is being seized, seized, as the coup is being resisted, as Madrid University has been defended. You can see why he thought that, the, that this was the moment for a rebirth of a historical novel. Right. Now I'll do Benjamin. Right. Um, that's not right. Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history are very different. Um, very, very different. They're written like um, they're, they're Benjamin's last work, written shortly before his suicide at Port Bou on the Franco Spanish border. Um, in 1940, as he was trying unsuccessfully to escape into, 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 into Spain, um, to escape the, na the Nazis and the Vichy regime. Now, there are 18 theses, uh, but I'm going to concentrate on only three. Uh, the sixth thesis, the ninth thesis, and the fourth thesis. Oh, you've got that there. Hold that there. That's the sixth thesis. Right. When Benjamin argues, that to understand the past historically, uh, you have to seize hold of a memory as it flashes at a moment of danger. And he goes on to say that, that, that this sort of, this, the spark of hope that that kind of process generates um, can only be clear if you're to, to the right, to the historian who is convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if it wins. And he has. His enemies not cease to be victorious. Now, this is a completely different tone than anything in Lucas. Oh, no, no, no. I'll leave that there. Yes. The, ninth th the ninth thesis, I'm sorry, is, 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 is about this. It's Paul Clay's Angelus Novus, uh, which, um, uh, which, uh, which Benjamin at one time had owned. Right. Now, no. the thesis. <laughs> this is Benjamin's ninth thesis. Um, which represents history as a catastrophe, a storm blowing from paradise, which propels the angel of history into the future, which is back his turn, while a pile of debris um, grows skyward before him. And this storm, Benjamin says, is what we call progress. Now, I hope you realize, can see the very obvious differences between the way Lukash is imagining progress and the way Benjamin is. This is progress as catastrophe. And the 14th thesis. Right. This is so. How do you understand this kind of catastrophic progress? Uh, this is where Benjamin argues um, that history is the subject of a structure whose site is not homogeneous, not empty time, but is filled by what he calls the presence of the now, in which which requires blasting it out of the continuum of history. Right. And and this is where he he, he gives us an example the way the French revolutionaries, the way the French revolutionaries understood themselves as, as identical to the Roman, uh, the, the Roman Senate, the ancient Romans. They were a rebirth of, of, of ancient Rome. That's how the French revolutionaries. I'm not saying this is necessarily right, but that is certainly how Benjamin reads it. Now, there's a kind of messianic quality to Benjamin's utopianism, which is not present in the Greek at all. Now, I've got a quote from Perry Anderson. I don't often break Perry Anderson. Right. Perry um, Anderson, you will recall, was once a supporter of the Fourth International and was once editor of the New Life Review. Um, now, this is an article that Anderson wrote in, in uh, 2011, um, in which he, he's, oh, he's writing about the historical novel, what, what Lukash had been writing about. Um, but he argues uh, that, there, that there was, in, in, recently we have seen, uh, in, in the 21st century, the late 20th, what he calls a postmodern turn. In the historical novel, uh, and what it is 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 represented by Latin American magic realism, by Vargas Llosa, Garcia Marquez, people like that. Now, what Anderson actually argues is that, and this is he go he looks back at Lukash and Benjamin, 
And he actually says the terms that I borrowed from my title. He says, Lukash imagines history as progress. Benjamin imagines history as catastrophe. Uh, and what, what Anderson concludes is that, is that the postmodern historical novel, the contemporary historical novel in 2011, was much, much closer to Benjamin than to Lukash. Uh, let me see that. The reason why it is, um, is because it's preoccupied uh, uh, with, uh, with, with, with it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the antipodes of its classical forms, not the emergence of the nation, but the ravages of empire, not progress as emancipation, um, but, in, but, catas but impending catastrophe. Now, I thought about, well, I read this because Perry Anderson, is, 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 he writes terribly well. I wish I could write as well as that, um, but I think he's wrong. Um, he's right about Latin American magic realism. I think that's true. I think Latin American novels. But what about the historical novel in Europe? Which, for example, I mean, what about Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose? Which, in which William of Baskerville, um, who is the central character, by the way, he represents, uh, uh, he represents critical reason in the face of medieval superstition. That's the exact opposite of what uh, Anderson says. More, more, more closer to home, what about Hilary Mantel? Um, you know, which is, well, she's probably the best known historical novelist writing, well, she's not writing anymore, but <laughs> best known historical novelist writing in English. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the Thomas Cromwell. Which is, you know, the, if you haven't read the novels, they're great. Uh, you may prefer the TV series, but nonetheless, they're great. Um, and again, the central character, Thomas Cromwell, uh, represents the triumph of critical reason. Now I know that it doesn't it doesn't end well, uh, but no one did if they're around Henry VIII, right? right but no, it's it's, it's the triumph of critical reason and upward social mobility. Right. Now, I think the reason Anderson is so gloomy about the, uh, about novels, but about reality too, is because he sees the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 as involving a collective a collective loss of a sense of history. Now, I don't think that's at all. I mean, I assume, no, I assume hardly anybody here thinks that's what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Because um, uh, this is why he says, um, put the, po non, the modern novel is a, a desperate attempt to awaken us to history in a time when any real sense of history has gone dead. I don't, do you all feel a real sense of history has gone dead because of the collapse of the Soviet Union? Yeah. Does anybody here think that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're in the you're in the wrong meeting. <laughs> you're in the wrong you're in the wrong place. I, I, it seems to me this is nonsense. Uh, not only is it nonsense, but, uh, although it's Perry Anderson, Perry Anderson's nonsense. In fact, it's very very peculiar nonsense because the experience of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And and uh, and the and, and the liberation. Yes, it was. I mean, I don't like the way it's turned out either. But there's a moment of liberation all across Russia and Eastern Europe, which is experienced by many by large masses of people as something akin to the kind of emergence of, uh, 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 of the kind of historical events which Lukash detected in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic periods. This these were moments. These were revolutionary moments. You know, um, the Gdansk shipyards. It was not we're not actually about, about what about how it turns out these are this is not about uh a, a loss of a sense of history now let me can i just okay. right you may wonder what that's for well it's to get away from quoting people but um going back from anderson to lukash and benjamin how I, well, they were writing about history. They were writing about history roughly in the periods, period 1936 to 1940. Benjamin definitely stopped writing in 1940. <laughs> and what I think you can say, and this is where Anderson has a point, that external history really was catastrophic. Yeah, I mean, what could be more catastrophic than the triumph of Hitler in Germany, uh, the, the, the Second World War, the Holocaust? It's, it, it is. It is it is the, the catastrophe of catastrophes, right? But and I, I hate to hate to, I don't want to sound like a cheerleader for either Stalin or Churchill. Um, but the Allied victory in 1945 clearly reverses this judgment, uh, even even for all the criticisms we would want to make of both Churchill and Stalin. Hence my picture of Russian and American soldiers greeting each other over the ruins of, of, of Nazi Germany. Now, and, and actually, I can 
tons of evidence of this in novels. Now, I'm now going to confess to something, which is I'm not really, while I'm not really uh, that interested in the historical novel at all, what I'm actually really interested in is science fiction. Um, <laughs> right, because, but they are connected, they are connected because science fiction novels, if you think about it, are historical novels of the future. <laughs> <laughs> Quote me that. It's a good line. Right. 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 No, 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 sorry. I, you can come in later. Right. Um, but if you look at the Asimov's Foundation trilogy, the, the novels, not the awful television series, or the Stugatsky Brothers' New Universe novels, that's so one from the Russia, one from America, you can see. Uh, that this is these are these are much more optimistic. They are much closer to how Lukash had imagined the historical novel. Now, um, I'm going to do something. Uh, uh, by the way, I, don't, I think this is less true for British and French science fiction. And I think the reason for that is the British and French are preoccupied with the collapse of their miserable empires. Um, it's but, but it doesn't matter because the history is written by the victors, and the victors in 1945 weren't really the British and the French. It was the Americans and the Russians. Right, that's the way. That's that's the point of that picture. Now, what what about now? Well, I'm I'm now going to do something very very boring, which is which is repeat what I have heard in almost every. Any the next point. I'm embarrassed to do this because it, uh, virtually every session I've been to, going these are the same catastrophes that people talk about. Um, it's obvious, isn't it? Really. Um, but yes, there's the COVID pandemic. Fifteen million deaths globally. Go on, the other guy, Joe. Um, global warming, which is nowhere near getting under control. The war in Ukraine, and the one that actually I don't think anybody else has mentioned this because people here are a bit optimistic about AI, aren't they? Um, but it is at least possible that the machines and the robots might outperform humans. You know, um, you've seen Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? You know about Skynet, right? Okay, I just, I just throw that in there. Now, this combination of crises, which we are faced with, um, might well be, uh, and I think Alex's book comes close to arguing that it is, uh, a return to the catastrophe, to the catastrophic in Benjamin's sense. Um, so yeah, this is something that, um, one more slide. Oh, we have not. Right. This is these are these are all science fiction. Somebody had to sneak science fiction in. Right. right. Um, uh, because all these catastrophes are addressed uh, and at length in, in contemporary science fiction. Uh, this is these are these are these are films and novels uh, and short stories, and and they're recurring themes. If, 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 I'm, if, I'm, if I'm not persuading you to read science fiction or at least watch it, um, try it. I mean, and, I, and you could expand all of this actually. Uh, all four of these catastrophes um, uh, are dealt with at great length in contemporary science fiction. Uh, the, the, I, I mean, I realise that AI might not end up like Terminator, um, <laughs> but you know, it's a possibility. Right, now, uh, what I want to do now, finally, is, uh, and, and again, talking about science fiction, I am moving towards a catastrophe's conclusion, which I'm reluctant to do in some ways, because really, my, my own personal sympathies are much closer to Lukash. I'm, I'm very old, uh, and I'm a child of the 1950s. The, I'm a child of the 1950s, you know, I got free school lunches and free school milk and free orange juice. And my parent, my, my family was a, um, who was from a very poor working class background. Um, and we, I went to university without fees. <laughs> uh, and all of that, 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 that period of progress conditioned my own political beliefs. And so I may have misunderstood the IS when I joined it. Um, but nonetheless, it seemed to me that, they, that, the, 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 that there was a Marxist version of progress, uh, which radicalized uh, social, the social democratic. But I, I, I'm genuinely unsure that progress, how can you still be sure that progress is likely to happen? One last slide. This is from a science fiction writer. Vladimir Sorokin is a really well-known Russian science fiction writer. He wrote the Ice Trilogy, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, and he fled. Russia shortly after, um, to the day before I think, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He's not Ukraine, he, he's really Russian, uh, and he's now living in temporary exile in Berlin. In other words, he reversed Lukash's journey. Uh, instead of going from Berlin to Moscow, he went from Moscow to Berlin. And, and this, is, this is his comment 
not just on the Ukrainian world, but on the contemporary cri multiple crises. Um, the world is changing so unpredictably that the classical realist prose isn't able to catch up to it. And, and this, is, this is why he prefers complicated optics. In order to see what is real, you need two telescopes, one from the past and another from the future. Now, what I want to point out is that that's very, very close to what Walter Benjamin said. It comes from a completely different starting point, but it's very, very different. It's the sense of double vision. Uh, for Benjamin, it's past and present. For Sorokin, it's past and future. So the key question, which faces us all, by the way, um, as we struggle to survive into the 22nd century, I know I won't, by the way, but, but some of you might make it make the 22nd century, is still is it history or is it catastrophe? Um, it was, is, is history the way Lukash imagined it, or is it the, the way Benjamin imagined it? Um, well, we'll see how that turns out, or at least those of you who are young enough will see how it turns out. Thank you. So I, I'm going to ask you to talk to your neighbors for a few minutes, then I'll call you back into the main room for questions and contributions. Please raise your hand. And then at the end, I will ask Andrew to sum up. Okay, thank you. So a lively discussion, that's fabulous. Andrew and I were saying that, so that that was really nice to hear you. So back to the main room, raise your hand. You have three minutes for the contribution. And uh, yes, I'll try to call as many people as possible. They come right, right there at the back with the glasses. Well, thanks very much, Andy. Um, we, had a, we were starting to discuss Blade Runner and the different versions, both Blade Runner and Dune and so on. So that got us back to science fiction. I just wanted to make two points. The, f the first is, I think when you contrast Benjamin and uh, Lukács, to be honest, you left out politics, because it seems to me with Lukács, yeah, you said he's a loyal member of the Communist Party, increasingly in fear for his life once he gets to Moscow, actually. Um, but um, and what that means is he's a supporter of the Popular Front policy that the Communist Party pursues from when 1935 onwards, uh, which involves a, an alliance between the workers' movement and the supposedly democratic imperialist bourgeoisies of Britain, the United States, France, and so on and so forth. And it seems to me you can't reduce, I mean, I agree, the historical novel is a great book. It made me read lots of Scots. Scott is great, actually, if you've got the time. Um, but um, you can't separate the book. And I think that uh, um, uh, uh, Lukács' increasing hostility to modernism, which is reflected, for example, in the quotation about Salambo that, uh, that, that you showed, you can't separate uh, that from his uh, being embedded in popular front politics. Doesn't mean that he's a tool of Stalin or anything like that. He was a great Marxist and, uh, and brave. As, as he showed during the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. But there's a political context there. Benjamin is much more isolated um, from any organized working class, class politics, but I think he has intuitions which, um, you know, certainly fit our situation much more, much more than Lukács does. You know, where's the, you know, the power of, what is it democratic humanism in the world in the world today i mean i just don't 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 see it what we see is a collapsing neoliberal center faced with an aggressive far right it's a very 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 diff different situation in a, you know in lots of ways in a bad way from the 1930s god i never thought i'd say that this is worse than the 1930s we haven't got quite there then but benjamin's view of history as catastrophe and it's not history or catastrophe uh, maybe this is something misleading in what uh, um, Anderson says. It's history as catastrophe. I think it fits our situation uh, much better. But the thing to underline, and again, it differentiates Benjamin from the postmodernist that Anderson is talking about, is that he does. Sorry, I'll stop. He doesn't give up. You know, for the 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 draft on the concept of history is about revolution. Benjamin says we should see revolution as pulling the emergency brake on uh, a train that is out of control. To me, 
that fits how we should understand revolution today much better than the idea of a kind of right a rise of democratic forces that will that will save us only revolution will save us thank you the comrade at the back you can stay there if you like okay thank i'll you. i'll stand up though um uh, yeah you talked about uh, benjamin and his theses as uh really showing the pessimism in his view of history um I, I think we need to to look really at what those theses are saying a little bit deeper uh, because benjamin does indeed have a view of of progress which isn't just pessimism he has had contact with with uh, marxist theory and he talks about for example the progress in uh, the technology as something different from human progress uh, as a total and I think the most interesting thesis um, from Benjamin is when he says that he analyzes why things have got so bad. And he says that the problem is precisely the philosophy which has dominated the SPD and, and German Marxism at that time, which said that progress is inevitable. Yeah, he says this philosophy is to blame. Um, he says, for example, that the, the biggest catastrophe was that the leadership of the SPD in Germany believed they were they were swimming uh, with the stream. Yeah. If you're swimming with the stream, then all you have to do is wait. And what he says is that through the inactivity of the leadership and therefore through the inactivity of the class, he talks about the most the, the tendon being severed of the most powerful limb of, of the German working class movement. And that is, is really, for me, the key of what what uh, Benjamin is trying to say, he's trying to identify what went wrong with with uh, the fight in the 1930s. Um, the, 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 the point is, um, you know, we, we can see in Benjamin, uh, in, in Benjamin, the, the importance of the working class and, in in, uh, and of, of revolution as well, which he often talks about in terms of, of, of mess, uh, messiah, uh, messiah and, and so on. But you see, Benjamin is so important because he's been used by the Frankfurt School to justify their retreat from working class politics. Benjamin is, is held there as an example of how hopeless it is to actually try and change things. And, and the result of that is that you have a, a Frankfurt school who called themselves Marxists, who did very little other than write analyses of, of jazz music. <laughs> they come right at the back with us. Yeah, you, uh, you're right, you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, stand up also. Uh, yeah, yeah, Marx 21 in Germany. Um, I'd agree with Alex on, on, on the point of uh, of Benjamin for nowadays, but I think in defense of, of Lukas and, and, and the historical novel, uh, it still helps us analyzing novels, for example, from the 50s, 60s, uh, when we take a look on, on, on non-European novels, for example, Palestinian, uh, Palestinian historical novel, especially in this time, in spite of, of the trage tragedy for the Palestinian people, the, the, the Nakba in 84, uh, 48, um, it helps us a great deal to, to understand the, 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 the democratic humanism coming up in the historical novel in Palestine, in spite of catastrophe, with the idea of progress, uh, developing out of this catastrophe, getting something positive out of it. And during the struggle, be it armed struggle, be it, uh, be it political struggle inside uh, of the occupied uh, Palestinian territories, uh, it helps us to, to take a look on, on Hassan Kanafani's democratic humanism. Uh, it helps us uh, analyzing the literature from within the occupied territories and the one in the exile. Um, so I don't think it has to be this either catastrophe or progress. We do have literatures where out of the catastrophe still there is the, the, the progress heading uh democratic humanist literature coming out of it and i think for this lucas still is uh, pretty much useful thank you yeah in a way it's a little bit a question because and, and i'm just thinking what is the place of fascism in the process of catastrophe i would say uh it's very important for us you know and why i'm going to lukash uh in france 
the question of the fight against fascism was nearly absent. You know, there were no analysis in the left of the danger of fascism for years and years. At least now, there are some discussions. Uh, but the main current talking about the danger of fascism is using, it's becoming a sort of theory of what they call fascism, fascization in French. Fascization? Uh, you know, it, it, because it's a debate, so we are trying to argue. Uh, we discover, I discovered that it was coming a lot from Pulanzas in the in, in the seventies. Uh, but back before coming, going back to the debates in the thirties and so, you know, I had an idea of a very caricature idea of Lukash of you know being you know very good in the twenties and in some ways retreating not to the victim of Stalinism to analyze this literature something not not going in at what was what going on, not taking position on what was going on. And I discovered he was writing an introduction to a book on novels and so on. Uh, I think it was in the 32 or 33, using the word of fascization, fascization, uh, in uh, developing something what was close to, you know, just uh, social democrat as social fascists. And so are responsible for what's happening and so on. okay i'm not going too far you know i was interested in what was developing and alex responded in some ways but behind because behind this idea of fascization now about the analysis and the connection between catastrophe and fascism is the idea developed now in france that the, the main thing is capitalism and so capital and ruling classes uh fascism is what they want what they are developing so we are fighting, for example, in France, base, you have to fight against capitalism, you have to fight against Macron, and not specifically to articulate with a fight against National Front, against the fascists and so on. The, and, and so I, I wanted to know uh, around what we were explaining uh, around Benjamin and Lukas, where, where the analysis, you know, I think there's a connection between what Alex said, you know, in fact, going from a very sectarian politics to a politics of popular front. Thank you. Hi, I'm Simon, a journalist on Socialist Worker. Uh, it means I'm embodiment of reification, according to Lukash, I believe. Um, what I think when people talk just on the Frankfurt School and stuff made me think that one of the things that always struck me about this is that we're bit, although they're very pessimistic, aren't they? And it's like, well, can you write poetry after the Holocaust is not actually that dumb a question. It's actually quite a sensible question. And that break of that catastrophe, the scale of the catastrophe, the defeat of the Russian Revolution, the rise of fascism, the Holocaust, to come out that end and still be a Marxist is not a bad thing to do, to be honest. To come out and do it and try and understand the world in any shape or form is not a bad thing to do. The fact that some of these people managed to still produce great insights into the world as it is, even on such tedious things as jazz music, is not necessarily the worst thing in the world, which brings me in that sense because the context bit then does matter because where you put fascism and Stalinism and your relationship to them matters in how you respond to those things. If there's only one catastrophe, that has an effect on how you view the rest of the world and the rest of the catastrophe. If you take a position that says the, the midnight of the century also included the counter revolution in Russia, and that had, had an effect which moved us backwards too, that shapes how you look at the world and therefore shapes how you want to change it. And therefore, I think that. With all the provisos, that relationship with Stalinism, or not having an alternative to it, which isn't necessarily the same thing, you don't have to like it, but you don't necessarily know what to do instead, is important in terms of how it shapes the intellectual world and how some of these amazing people end up looking at it. The last point I just want to make very briefly is on the question of the robots are all going to kill us. Well, Benjamin and Brecht talked about this a hell of a lot, to be honest. They didn't call it, didn't particularly talk about the robot bit of it. But the whole idea that technology, industry, mechanical reproduction changes the way in which we look at the world. And if we change the way we look at the world, we change our understanding of it, which changes how we can change it. Correct, as often was the case, was a little bit more direct. If millions of people can listen to radios, millions of people can produce things that can be put out through radios. And these things coming together is not something to be afraid of, but something to embrace. I accept our robot overlords may be coming to kill us. But it may also be the case that we can create a world where we use the tools of our technology that we can produce to produce a better world. Unfortunately, that is unlikely to happen under capitalism, but could happen under socialism. Thank you very much.
Well, firstly, thanks to the speaker. When I read the title, of the meeting, I wasn't expecting to get a Terminator reference. I'm really happy that I did because <laughs> it's one of the best films ever made. But anyway, <laughs> I think that the points that people have made about being nuanced about Lukash's historical development, his intellectual development over time, are incredibly important because the truth is, Lukash did accommodate to Stalinism. He did politically accommodate to Stalin Stalinism in the 1930s and afterwards. He was still one of the greatest intellectuals of the 20th century. He didn't become an idiot overnight. And therefore, if you look at his work after his revolutionary period, what you find is great insight. But as Alex, I think, uh, said as well, insight which is contaminated by, uh, by, by, bad, by bad politics. A lot of the points which you've made about Lukács can be found very, very clearly in history of class consciousness anyway. Uh, this uh, historical, this history of reason, I guess that you could call it. I mean, he says in history and class consciousness, when the capitalist class first comes on the scene as a revolutionary class, it has a project for the transformation of the whole of society. It says that it's going to make society rational, that it's going to make it reasonable. Uh, these are the ideas for the Enlightenment, the ideas of the French Revolution, that we're going to transform society. It's going to be a reasonable place. It's going to elevate human dignity. It's about liberty, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that once they actually take power, once they construct the capitalist system, then it's nothing of the sort. They realize that it's a completely irrational system. It's a system which is given to crisis all the time, to war, to economic crisis, and so on and so forward. And also you have the rise of the working class. They realize that they have to repress them. So actually their system is not about liberty or uh, equality uh, or any of that as well. And as Lukács really says, I think, in history and class consciousness, that the result of this, pro uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, process is that you get a sort of a, a reified form of capitalist rationality. Uh, extreme rationality in very narrow, narrow fields, for example, in science, in uh, technology, uh, in technical ways of manipulating society and so on. But no idea of how you can actually uh, uh, understand the whole of society and try to turn it into a, a rational society, which actually means which actually meets human needs and so on. And there's also very interesting parts in history and class consciousness where he points to where the far right fits in this and why at the intellectual level. He says that one response to this is that people just say, well, well, human beings aren't rational. This idea that liberals have, that it's all about progress, it's all about the advance of science and rationality and so on, it's clearly not the, not the case because the society that we live in is deeply, uh, is deeply, is deeply unrational. And therefore we have to fall back on, you know, authority, uh, traditional forms of authority, the family, the state, uh, nationalism, uh, nationalism and all of this sort of stuff. The difference, however, with history and class consciousness, Lukács' great work of his revolutionary period, uh, is that the punchline is much, much, much clearer. He says that uh, the working class is the heir to those enlightenment values. The working class is a democratic class, it's a collective class, and it can actually transform society in a rational direction, which elevates human dignity, which meets, uh, which meets, uh, which meets, uh, which meets human needs, and does away with the crisis and war and poverty of capitalism. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have time for the last contribution that is going to be you. Oh, just as final little comments on some of the other comments. So, so the idea that okay, the Palestinian novel you still actually still is a useful and there the out of catastrophe comes, you know, this uh, the democratic humanism or et cetera, except that is that democratic humanism the way to 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 win liberation in Palestine, right? I mean it's the same and, and, and uh, the, uh, there is some interesting, you know, things about jazz, except exactly, I think, rather reactionary conclusions about jazz, however interesting those things were. And those were tied in, the, 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 um, which, which with the, Lukács' whole rejection of, of modernism was a rejection of breaks and fractures and whatever, and in a way then, or, uh, uh, not really an understanding of, of revolution or, or, you know, not a way of analyzing culture that, that was very happy to look back at the bourgeois revolutions because you're aligning with the bourgeois right now, but not about what, what, what kind of revolution is going to be needed to, to break that in the future. And I think that's, that's what's been, and right now we have a, um, you know, it, it's, I, 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 I don't think the world is going to get anywhere if we're saying that this, let's wait for this catastrophe to be over and come down to a to normal society and we can build from that. You know, the, the only hope we have is that in this catastrophe, there are new fractures and we can, you know, the working class will be people will be forced to react and open up the revolution. And that's that's why I, I don't think, you know, so picking those things to say, well, that was interesting about Lukash isn't actually, you know, the best way to look at, uh, at, at cultural analysis and what we need to do to, to move forward to save the world. Um, because people have been so good with timekeeping, I have time for one or maybe two more contributions if uh, someone else wants to say something before I ask Andrew to sum up. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it does all feel like quite a long way of saying just socialism or barbarism, right? And it's sort of, as, as presented in the presentation, I don't know that much about Luke Hatchell, sort of, you know, Benjamin outside of this, right? It does seem like you've got this sort of like just dichotomy between this progress or catastrophe when it's sort of like, I've got a phone in my pocket that I can talk to anyone on any continent in the world on at any time. Um, and also the lithium sort of like in the battery for that sort of like is environmentally devastating. The coal tan in the sort of, you know, in the processes is dragged out by child laborers in the Congo sort of like with hand axes, all these kind of things, right? Um, so it, it, it's both at the same time, you know, in a sense and sort of that, and, and they interact with each other. And, and it is a matter of, which I think has been quite well emphasized in this meeting, sort of class struggle, whether it will be progress or catastrophe in the end, you know, which it's not to be. Um, and I, I also kind of feel like there's a danger in this way of talking about it, which isn't your fault or the fault of this meeting. It's just like, uh, I think it's a, whole, a broader problem than the left of looking at these kind of quite abstract terms of like new factory progress and uh, Benjamin and catastrophe, like sort of in isolation, where they kind of need to be looked at as part of the whole Marxist sort of like framework, really like grounded on historical materialism. So when I talk about the catastrophe of sort of like the environmental destruction, we need to talk about relations of production and forces of production. When we talk about progress, we need to talk about how can we change, you know, concretely, how can we change these things, which of course we can. And I think once we start looking into that slightly more uh, detailed sort of like, you know, viewpoint, then it becomes less of this all consuming, oh, is it progress or is it catastrophe, is big thing bearing down on this, becomes like a series of tasks to be accomplished by the working class. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, um... Thank you for the talk. I think it was brilliant. And I think there have been some great points raised. Um, I was just wondering, because I'm a bit wary, I mean, from a post-colonial, anti-colonial uh, viewpoint, the question of progress and the question of catastrophe, like, I would just raise the question, would progress imply something teleological, as in linear in that sense, which would relegate certain progresses toward the past, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and what was what would the role of storytelling be? Because we know Benjamin speaks about that as well. And sci-fi, of course, is extremely important if you're looking at the future from the past, then whose past is it, for example? Um, so these were just some things that I was thinking, and I just wanted to introduce these also. Okay, I don't see any more hands. Um so before asking Andrew to sum up, um, just want to remind people that we have uh, um, books that we sell. Those are free, um, simply free here, but uh, we have many more uh, bookmarks downstairs. So please go there and buy as many books as possible uh, about Lukács, Benjamin, and whomever else. And, and then as well, if you enjoyed the meeting, um, and please consider to join the SWP. We have uh, joining the membership forms there, um, and then you can give it to me or any other people in the team t-shirt. Um, okay, without further ado, thank you everybody for the great comments, contributions, and questions, and I'll ask Andrew to sum up. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, I'll try and dip down something all. Uh, but I won't probably get through them probably. Uh, Alex's first one. Um, I'm I'm sorry you thought I didn't do, do the Lukash's politics. I did. I said he did all the twenties stuff. Um, but you're quite right. Um, really, I just m mentioned the Spanish Republic, and I, I should have stressed uh, that, that it's it's to do with his popular front stylist. It is, um, and which I don't sympathise with. And my sympathies are with the Poom, uh, which suggests a different heresy. Right. Um, but yeah, you, you're right. I, sh I should have mentioned that. I, I don't, but I think in general, I did talk about the politics of both Lukash and Benjamin. Um, that's a, that's a uh, sort of response. Um, now, your question, which about Moore's Law, I was trying to work out. I mean, yes, I'm familiar with Moore's Law, um, uh, but I, I don't see how that changes the idea that the historical, that, that SF is the historical novel of the future. Not all of it. But a lot of it, it aims to the end of this current, the as I say, the science the current fear among computer scientists for quite some time. Yeah, I know. That's what, and I say, I like to why generally that is what's altered. Yeah, look, I, I, in that case, I'm, I'm clearer now. Uh, my response to that is, is yes, <laughs> if you're a cultural pessimist, you, I mean, uh, the, 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 the obvious example to think about, uh, or counter example, is always very, is the optimistic reading um, uh, of, of AI, um, which is, is, is in those wonderful culture novels, um, which are, which are, in which the, the, the AI uh, and, the, and the humans work together. Uh, and, uh, and this is an alternative possibility. Uh, so let's call that's 
Yeah. Which and we will have to see how that works out. Works out. You said I should join the SWP. It's <laughs> difficult if you live in Melbourne. Um, <laughs> I, I think if I were here, I might. Right now, um, the um, uh, yeah, two people, uh, the comrade there with the lab tissue and, and Simon, went on about um, the Frankfurt School and cultural pessimism. Now, I have to say, well, I didn't discuss the Frankfurt School at all, right? And I didn't uh, say that uh, Benjamin was a pessimist, I said it was a catastrophe, uh, which is actually a different position, actually. Um, I deliberately decided not to talk about the Frankfurt School, who I agree, I don't know how clearly have a cultural peasant's position, but that's not what Lukash's position is, and it's not what Benjamin's is either. Um, so I was a bit surprised that two of you picked up on, on, on the Frankfurt School, because I deliberately decided not to do that. Um, but okay, I mean, <laughs> right, we all have our own preoccupations, right? Okay. Um, mine is not really a Dorno and Holger. Okay, the German comrade over there uh, uh, said that, that yeah, that the, the, the historical novel, The Democratic Humanism, could, could might well apply to non-European novels, the Palestinian novel in particular. Uh, and yes, I, I might be true. Um, I'm trying to think about this, but I mean, combined and uneven development right, does actually preclude the possibility that, that which, which Lukas, I think, got the toys with, that everything is going to be the same everywhere. It isn't. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I can see that the role of democratic humanism in Palestine and elsewhere you know, I can understand how it works. I can even understand it works in Latin America. But I think you have to have lots of reservations about that. I have clear reservations about the idea that the bourgeoisie is a progressive class anywhere. Uh, and I have, I have clear reservations about the idea that Hamas is. Uh, right. Um, the French comrade asked about um, oh, fascist, fascization. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're right, and I think the, the, the focus on capitalism rather than fascism, I mean, I mean, is 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 is, is a mistake. I mean, I mean, I I, I think I think that um, uh, in, uh, both look from very different perspectives. Both Lukash and Benjamin focus on fascism, on national socialism, fascism, and and they do so because they realise. What the, the catastrophe is not just the catastrophe of the German, but the, 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 the German is a capitalist society, that the Weimar Republic is a bourgeois state. Yeah, all right, okay. okay. But this is different. Uh, and, and the difference of national socialism, which which you know which reduce which reduces Europe to, to, to rubble, Benjamin doesn't get to see that. Um, but but that sort of you, you do have we do have to focus on the specificities of fascism, and, and I think it's not enough. I, I think you're right. It's not enough to say focus on Macron. For, no, 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 no. Actually, the problem of the, of the far right is a specific problem. Um, I to get that. Where have I got to next? Um, uh, yeah, the good comrade with the blue picture. I actually agreed with you. So you said actually. Um, I think. Um, I think the response. Lukash is a is a very nuanced thinker, um, and history and class consciousness is an extremely important book. Uh, um, but nonetheless, it's also true that he accommodated to Stalinism. Uh, and it's also true that the, under the circumstances, most of us probably would. Uh, um, well, that is shot him. The amazing thing about Lukash's biography is that he lives through a real ripe old age. It's astonishing. Um, he, gets a, he gets locked up twice by the Stalinists. You know, they, they lock him up in 1939, you know, but when the, the Nazi Soviet pact. Yeah, that's a good time to be an anti-Nazi in, in, in the Soviet Union. But they also ran, they also lock him up in 1956 because he's in Nimri Nazi's government. Um, and, the, the, and, and they actually said to Lukash, um, all we want you to do is, is denounce Nazi. We don't mean we, we want you to say exactly what um, you, you've already said. Now that's all that's all we want to do, just say what your objections to Nazi are when we know you object to him. And Lukash replied. I will make those criticisms of Nazi when he is free, free to reply. I mean, that's wonderful. You know, I mean, yes, he accommodated to Stalinism, but he also a lot of the time didn't. I mean, I don't know. It's, I mean, I, I wish I, I hope I'd be that brave in those circumstances. I'm not convinced I would be. Um, I don't know whether that's a, a reasonable answer to the question. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, I'm sorry. 
I've, I've written you down as the bearded comrade. <laughs> well, sorry, <laughs> the bearded comrade over there. Uh, is it all just socialism or barbarism? Both at the same time. Well, it's not, it's not all just socialism or barbarism. No. I actually think that Lukash and Benjamin are, are, are talking about different things to Rosalind. In fact, I think it's very clear. The Luxembourg is barbarism for Luxembourg is the First World War. It really is. Uh, and, and she really has a point, too. I mean, yes, we now know, thanks to the Second World War, <laughs> things could get worse than they were uh, in, on, in, in the First World War, but it, it wasn't obvious at the time. That's what she means by barbarism. Um, so I think it's a little different. Um, but, uh, but the idea is, is, do we understand both progress and catastrophe as part of the world in which we live? Um, and, and shouldn't historical materialism understand it? So, yeah, I actually am inclined towards that view. Uh, I, I said, I confessed at the end <laughs> that I was inclined towards uh, a progressivist view, uh, but I'm not. But I also confess that I'm less persuaded by that than I used to be, um, because it's less and less compelling. Uh, but what one sees in in, in, a, in historical reality is the combination of progress and catastrophe at different moments and different times. And the, the question really is, is what conjuncture we face with now? Oh, hell, I promised never to use the Althusserian term conjuncture. But I mean, that's the issue. Uh, and the moment now seems increasingly catastrophist. You know? um, I don't know whether that's an adequate answer to your question, but yes, clearly they are both part of the historical process. And clearly both Lukash and Benjamin perceive things that are actually going on in historical reality. Um, well, I'm right over there. All right, no, I just got the time. Good. Uh, is progress teleological? Was the question you raised. Um, I think at times, I'm not for Benjamin, no. Um, I think at times Lukas toys with that idea. Uh, and um, you, uh, look, you can see why. I don't, I'm sorry. I, it, it's, it's terribly reassuring to, to believe that history is on your side. Uh, and clearly at times Lukas did believe that. Um, I, I would like to think that was true. Right? Uh, I'm not at all persuaded. Um, um, if if, if history is on our side, it will be so because we make it so. Yes. 